For those of us who have seen archery videos online, you likely may have come across the trick in which the archer can curve an arrow in mid-air, and this has been popularized by Lars Anderson. However, while we know this is possible, there has been an extended discussion on whether historical archers, or more specifically war archers or military archers, did this in battle. And this has become a fairly debated topic. Part of the reason is that many people combine historical archery with historical war archery or historical warfare. And these things actually aren't one and the same. And when we look at the source material, we'll investigate further why we can't assume that historical archers use these turning arrow shots in actual, practical, and realistic situations. Before we go on to the historical analysis, I want to quickly clarify that there are actually two different tricks involved here. The first is bending the arrow in flight. That one is a much simpler trick. The principle of shooting straight and accurately is that you want the limbs to operate in synchronization. So they both move together and push the arrow forward at the same time. Now, if we move the arrow above the center knocking point or below, the limbs now impart a somewhat unequal force as one limb will push it out faster than the other. The result of this is the arrow will not leave in a straight line, it leaves in an offset manner. What then happens is that the arrow will then correct its flight and then move straight back towards the target. And that in its basic essence is how you accomplish the arrow's curvature in flight. The second trick is the returning arrow. And that's the shot in which the arrow is shot forward and then it bends around and comes back towards the shooter's direction. That's actually quite a different and specialized trick and we'll explain why in detail a bit later. Now the first trick which involves turning the arrow doesn't require special equipment. You can use a normal bow and standard arrows, whether wood or carbon. Um, you can have differences in the length and spine, especially the weight and shape of the arrow point. Um, heavier points will make this trick a little bit easier. But apart from that, you can bend all arrows. All that really matters is how far you offset that. And with some practice and experimentation, you should be able to know the flight path of the arrow, depending on how, how far you move the arrow up or down. That's the secret behind it. Now, realistically, this could be done in a real situation. Because you don't need special equipment, you can actually do this on the fly. If you need to bend the arrow a certain distance off to the side, then you could, in theory, uh, calculate how far you have to uh, offset the arrow and then uh, do the shot. Now the misconception that people have with this trick shot is that you can bend the arrow around a corner. This actually isn't correct or not realistically accurate. You can bend the arrow around objects, yes, but you're actually shooting in a straight line. What you're doing is moving around an object not shooting around a corner. Essentially, we think of a corner like a 90 degree uh, angle where the arrow will go around like that. That's not what's happening in this turning arrows trick. I'm actually shooting straight towards the camera in this case, but instead of going straight into the camera, the arrow will be flung off to the side and then move around the camera like that. Or if you do the opposite way around with a blunt arrow, um, instead of shooting straight towards me, you are shooting the arrow off to the side and then it corrects back towards me. The key point to make is that I'm not actually going past the center line of the shot. If that's my intended direction, all I can really do is to offset the arrow temporarily so it goes off to the side and it comes back on target. I'm not going to get much further past that center point. So the arrow won't keep on going and going and going and going. It doesn't work that way. So really all you're doing is altering the initial flight path 
but it will correct and return back on target. That's the essence of the trick. Now, if we were to apply this in a military context, then it's kind of hard to imagine because firstly, close quarters archery is not something which really happened. And we'll debate this in a different video. But if for some reason you had to shoot an arrow around the corner, you actually couldn't. Um, the arrow doesn't bend that far around. Now, if I was standing a few feet behind a tree and you had to hit me, you could bend the arrow around the tree to hit me. But if I was standing at a crossroads around the other corner, you couldn't get the arrow to come and hit me. That's not the intended purpose and function of the turning arrow. Now, if the turning arrow can't do that, what about the returning arrow? Because we can clearly see that goes in a much wider flight path and can go around a corner. As cool as that might be, there's a very big problem. We said before that with the turning arrows, that can be done without any special equipment. You can use a normal arrow and a normal bow. The returning arrow is very specifically a trick shot with a trick arrow, and that comes straight from the source material. The source is Arab archery, an Arabic manuscript of about AD 1500. And this is a fairly well-known text. Uh, a lot of historical shooters um, and enthusiasts will reference this book. Now, the trick is outlined in chapter 44, which is on stunt shooting. So again, to be very clear, this shot comes from a stunt shooting chapter. And the chapter outlines 14 different stunts. Now, some of these have some justification in real life shooting in real situations, such as extremely high angles or low angles. Some of these tricks are purely to impress people. And the returning arrow is number 12 on the list. And we'll read out the entire section. The 12th is shooting the returning arrow. An arrow which, as it travels on its flight, suddenly returns to the point whence it was shot, and may even hit the archer himself. Such an arrow is made by shaving a shaft evenly and forcing it through a ring so that it emerges perfectly uniform. You then cut into it two knocks, one on each end, and thin each end down a little. Trim it with eight feathers, four at each end next to a knock, placing each feather on one end opposite to a feather on the other in the same alignment. You next bore in the center of the groove of each knock a small hole, filling the one with lead and leaving the other empty. Knock the arrow on the end which has been filled with lead and shoot it with the bow hand raised as high as your head. No sooner does it reach the limit of its flight than it swerves and returns to the point of when it was shot. If it should fail to return to the place where you were standing when you shot it, know that you are not exact in its construction. In describing the returning arrow, Al-Tabari stated that its middle part should be thinned down but failed to mention anything concerning the hole in each knock or the lead filling of the one and the emptiness of the other. If his description should work, then the thinning of the middle part of the arrow would take the place of the two holes and the lead in one of them. Otherwise, it would be better to follow the first description and to ignore the additional remarks of Al-Tabari. The purpose of such an arrow is to deceive an enemy who happens to be at your side and to shoot him while he's unaware. To roughly illustrate what this might look like, you have a wooden shaft and you have eight fledgings, eight feathers, four on one end and four on the other perfectly aligned. So you have eight uh, fletches in total. You have no point on the arrow. The point of the arrow is replaced by a plane in with a hole drilled in or bored into the shaft. The other end of the shaft also has a knock and a hole bored into it. This end is filled with lead. That means that the back part of the arrow is extremely heavy compared to the almost weightless front. You then shoot this arrow possibly off center, so it sets up with the hand above the head, and then what will then happen is the arrow will go forward and at the peak of its flight will turn around and come back towards the archer. In other words, you're using a green arrow style 
trick arrow. You can't do this with a normal arrow. It must be done with a specially made and modified shaft. The appendix of the same book contains the commentary from the editors of this book. While the Arabic adjective that describes the arrow is correctly translated as returning, the temptation to use the word boomerang was very strong. That such an arrow was also known to the English appears from the following quotation of a footnote on page 163 of The English Bowman by T. Roberts. It is said that if a light shaft is feathered at both ends, the wood being lightest at the pile end, and the feather trimmed low at the knock end and high at the pile end, and shot against the wind, that it will return back again, and that a shaft feathered in the middle will in its flight make a right angle. So we have a bit more detail as to construction of the arrow. You have low profile fletchers on the back end of the arrow, or the knock end. You have high profile fletchers on the front end. And you shoot against the wind, which makes a lot of sense. So you shoot the arrow into the wind and the shape of the fletchers and the direction of the arrow spin, naturally, will force the arrow to turn back towards the shooter. Interesting to talk about how if you put the fletchers in the middle of the shaft, you can make it turn at a right angle. So the modern day writer then goes on to talk about their experimentation with this arrow. We made an arrow very carefully on the Arabic plan, cutting knocks in both ends and making a hole at the bottom of one knock and filling it with solder and trimming it with low feathers at the knock end and high feathers at the pile end, though there was no pile. Basically, it's a pointless arrow, literally. The only oversight was that we used six feathers instead of eight. Whether or not the difference of two feathers was the factor that caused the disappointing action of the arrow, we do not know. But though shooting it repeatedly and against a very light wind, we could not make it return. The graceful sweep, like that of a soaring buzzard, which we had hoped for, was not even suggested. What invariably happened was that the arrow would go as much as usual for about 40 yards from a 46 pound Osage bow of good cast and then would turn over, flutter indefinitely with an almost complete loss of force and fall back to the earth knock end first with just enough momentum to stick up. We agree perfectly with the author that it did not return to the place where we were standing because we were not exact in its construction. The arrow certainly reversed itself on every flight and lost practically all forward motion, and we are inclined to believe that if it were properly designed, it might swing around in a great arc back to the point of departure, instead of becoming tangled up in its own conflicting forces and falling in impotence. However, we felt certain that the overt use of such an arrow to shoot an unsuspicious enemy who was standing at the archer's side was no more than an untested bit of romantic fancy. During these same experiments, we tried shooting an arrow that was further in the middle and found that it did exactly what was expected of it. From the same bow, it would also fly straight for about 40 yards and then would turn at a right angle with apparently very little diminution in speed. There seemed to be no obvious way of controlling the direction of its altered course. Shot from the left of the bow, it might turn straight down into the earth, fly off to the right, or go in any other direction. We finally lost it when it spit off toward the left in a high, wide, and handsome course at right angles to its original line of flight, and cut through the leaves of the tall forest like a swift and reckless bird. It was fun. So what can we learn from this? The first is that the arrow that potentially could go at right angles with the feathers in the middle didn't. It could do so, but according to the testers in the book, they couldn't control where the arrow went. So that already is a big sign that an archer can't actually control the flight of the arrow and make it turn in midair. It has to be done with the correct preparation and technique beforehand. You obviously can't control it once you shoot it. So if you can't make it work reliably, then it brings up the validity of such a claim into question. The second is that they couldn't make the arrow return to the point of origin. Now they did point out that their arrow was not made to the correct specifications. They used fewer feathers than the Arabic source, 
and their result was the arrow tumbling once it reached the maximum peak about 40 yards. So instead of coming back towards them, it would fly towards the 40 yard mark and by that point it would lose all energy and tumble point first and stick upwards in the ground. Now that was of course with the incorrect construction, uh, with the correct construction, I guess you could make it work. Um, Lars Anderson achieved a much more majestic arc towards the user, but even that didn't reach the point of origin. Now, could this be applied in a combat situation or military context? And quite simply, no. It wouldn't be plausible in any way. There are several factors to this. The first factor is that the scenario is really implausible. If you have an enemy that is next to you, why would you shoot an arrow away from the enemy in order to hit them? Why not just shoot them straight here or use a different weapon? So as the uh, editors pointed out in the appendix, it's a bit of fancy. This might have been the historical example of a comic book superhero shot. So again, the possibility of making the perfect arrow shot in perfect wind conditions to strike a person who is standing next to you, that is incredibly unbelievable. I mean, we have a hard time as it is shooting an arrow straight towards the target. Trying to hit a target behind us using a curving arrow, that's really pushing imagination. Even if we did somehow achieve this returning arrow shot, it's pointless. It's literally pointless. The arrow in question that was very clearly specified in the Arabic source meant you couldn't use an arrow point. The arrow point was absent, it was an empty groove, the other end was filled with lead. So you needed to purposely make an arrow that was completely useless in combat. So if you were hit by this pointless arrow with absolutely no weight on its tip, it's not going to achieve anything. Even from a simple physics perspective, you're going to lose energy as soon as you turn the arrow. And the arrow will retain the most energy as it flies straight towards the target. Once it starts turning or turning back around, it would have lost all its momentum. There is no motor or engine in the back to propel it back towards the user or around the corner with more energy than it started with. Even if you could see through walls and know exactly where the enemy was and you could somehow place the arrow exactly on target, it wouldn't do anything. Final thoughts. Could an archer turn an arrow in flight? Yes. Did historical archers curve arrows in flight? The best we can say is that from one source, Arab archery in the 1500s, supported by a late source, that's the English Bowman by T. Roberts, later on the 1800s, that the trick could be done. Was this a military or combat technique? As far as we know, no. The only source which supports the idea of turning arrows in flight does so from a stunt shooting specific chapter. There is no commentary on its adaptation for a combat purpose, nor is there any historical record of an archer curving a shot in actual battle. As far as I understand, the notion that ancient warriors or archers could shoot around corners is implausible. It will be a highly fictionalized account of a trick shot but I don't think we know it anywhere near enough to say that this was definitely a combat technique by ancient archers. From what we understand from the original source, um, from modern experiments, and from an understanding of physics, this would not work in real combat in real life. In a way, I hope you found this interesting. This is New Sensei. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.